I'm Sherry Jorgensen and I'm here with this week's Come Follow Me Book of Mormon study. We're going to study Ether. We're actually going to do all three weeks in one video so we can pull this whole story to relate to our lives. This story can be related to you personally, it can be related to your home, it can be related, relate, related to our nation, but I'm hoping to bring this right down to the individual person to understand how important we are in the eyes of God and the plan that he has set for us. The Jaredites were a promised people. They, are, they were brought to the promised land, a land that the Lord had said he had reserved for only specific people, people, people that he brought who were willing to serve him. And if they served him, they would prosper. And if they did not, then the, the protection of the Heavenly Father would be removed and eventually there would be destruction. This land is saved for a people who will worship him. And so we have only, well, I just, I mean, I want to think of, I think about the Israelites when they were brought across the Red Sea and they were, and, and they were promised the promised land. They had to dwell in the wilderness for 40 years so that they could prepare to be a people ready to follow God and to be his people. And he could be their God, right? It's so beautiful. And then we have um, Lehi's family who crossed the waters. To, and they also had to dwell in the wilderness for a, so, quite a period of time before they crossed the waters over to the promised land so that they could be his people and he could be their God. And then he had the, Jer the Jaredites, the Jaredites are actually before Lehi, but he had the Jaredites during the time of Noah that he brought to the promised land. And then he has us. The pilgrims set that stage. They crossed the ocean for us, seeking religious freedom, seeking a people who wanted to serve the Lord with their whole heart, mind, and soul, soul, and who wanted God to be their God. And they said, we'll be your people. And that's who we are. We are here because our ancestors loved the Lord. They loved the Lord. And they prepared, you know, they made that journey on the Mayflower over and across. It was not easy. If any time you have thought that this whole journey in preparing a promised land was ever easy, it wasn't. It's still not today. And you know what though? It's always been worth it. The Lord promises to be there with us. He promises to go ahead of us and prepare. So let's talk about the Jaredites. They lived in a time of the Tower of Babel where there was the confounding languages. No one understood each other. And so there was so much confusion and I'm sure fighting and frustration and bitterness, you, you can't understand each other. <laughs> Super frustrating. So they went to the Lord. They cried to the Lord to please don't confound our languages. Allow us to understand each other, share with each other, help each other. And the Lord granted them. I will have a righteous people. That's fine. We will do this. And so, um, and, and you know, how many times did they cry to the Lord? So many times. And when I think about how often he says from chapter 34, if you go from 34 to 42, I've highlighted in two different, three different colors, three different things. Cry to the Lord or inquire of the Lord repeatedly. Seek his guidance. Seek his help. What can I do? And I used to see in this last general conference, she encourages us to ask the Lord, what am I doing that I shouldn't be doing? Or what do I need to be doing that I'm not doing? And seek his guidance in our lives. He will direct us every step of the way. So they say that they cry unto the Lord. And then constantly the Lord has compassion. He gives them answers. He understands them. I will help you. I will guide you. And the other thing that, that I highlighted was go. How many times they were directed by the Lord to go and do? Go and do. Go and do. Because living this life directed by the Lord is a life of action. Faith is a life of action. We have to go and do so that we can become. Because going and doing and being active in our faith is how we progress, is how we grow. Going through trials is how we develop and we become refined and purified. And so then they have to dwell in the wilderness. In verse five, it says, and it came to pass that the Lord commanded them that they should go forth into the wilderness. But the to verse before that, four, the Lord came down and talked with the brother Jared, and he was in a cloud, and the brother Jared saw him not. My daughter was talking about that verse when she first read it, and she thought, how can we live our life so the Lord doesn't have to be in a cloud, <laughs> so that we can actually see him? And this, these verses actually, talk, not, she, I don't think she really meant like to see him like with her physical eyes, because very seldom do people get to see him with physical eyes, but to really feel and know that he's with us. But he directed them, and he said, he, he, he commanded them to go into the wilderness. 
And I mentioned that those other four groups that were led by the Lord of the Promised Land, even the Promised Land of, um, of old, were all people who had to dwell in the wilderness for refinement. And wilderness in our lives is our trials, our tribulations, things that we're asked to do, the afflictions that we, are, that we have in our lives are our wilderness because we, we get to practice enduring them without murmuring and without um, being upset, but with faith and with focusing on what the Lord is asking us to do to prepare us for the promised land. And then he also says, the Lord, and this is in five, the Lord did go before them and did talk with them as he stood in the cloud and he gave direction whither they should go. When, when the Lord tells us that he will go before us and prepare what we're going to go through, he means everything. So when you're going through a trial or tribulation, we already know that the Lord suffered for all of our afflictions, all of our pain and our suffering, as well as our sin and iniquities. But he has gone before us and prepared a path possible for us. And he will be with us every step of the way, even when it's difficult and we're going through hard things and we're learning difficult lessons. He will be there to help us if we will turn to him in gratitude. Russell Nelson just gave us a talk of hope. And what was that talk of hope that he gave us? He said, be grateful. Be grateful during a time of uncertainty. Be grateful for what the Lord has given you and what he has done. And then share that gratitude to others so that they can then look inside their lives and find gratitude. So they can see the Lord's hand in their lives and they can see that he has prepared them for where they're at today. And everything that they're going through is prepared for their good so that they can progress. So because if there's an eternal perspective that we're asked to see, we're looking ahead past this life. The Lord sees us as who we are and who we are meant to be and so he's going to guide us so that we can become all that we are and all that we are meant to be and so in verse 9 we have where it says and it is a land of promise and whatsoever nation shall possess it shall serve god god and in this also it says in like 12 it's a choice land free from bondage and from captivity and from ill all other nations under heaven if they will but serve god of the land who is jesus christ if we will serve the Lord, he will protect us. And so then in, in 11, we have repent. We have repent often in, in the scriptures. Over and over, every prophet came to teach us to repent. Because repentance is how we are stay, our will stays in line with the Lord's, right? So anyways, he, does, he teaches them to build a barge. Tight like a dish. And let's go over that. 17. And they were built after, okay, wait, let's go a little bit higher up here. Let's go to 16. And the Lord said, go to work, go to work and build after the manner of barges, which ye have hitherto built. And it came to pass that the brother Jared did go to work. <laughs> he did what he was told to do. Go to work. Okay, let's go to work. <laughs> and also his brethren and built barges after the manner which they had built, according to the instructions of the Lord. Following the Lord is always the best way. And we have a prophet, we have a mouthpiece of the Lord. When he tells us to do something, we should do it because it's going to bless our lives. So even something as simple as share Thanksgiving every single day for seven days. Following that counsel will bring the lie of Christ into our lives, period. The Lord will give us directions, simple as they may be sometimes, to help us. Now, building a barge is a little more difficult, but he's going to give them step-by-step -step direction. And they were small and they were light upon the water, even like unto the lightness of a fowl upon the water. Light. I love that, that word of lightness because I feel like the gospel of Jesus Christ is light. Light in both weight and light in brightness. And we need to remember that it's light and weight and not be weighed down by things that we feel are our are, are obligation and instead find the gratitude of why we do those things so that they can become light, right? Light in weight. 17. And they were built after the manner that they were exceedingly tight, even that they would hold water unto a dish. And the bottom thereof was tight like unto a dish. And the sides thereof were tight like unto a dish. And the ends thereof were peaked. And the top thereof was tight like unto a dish. And the length thereof was the length of a tree. And the door thereof was shut, was tight like unto a dish. Okay, we have to do this. We have to build ourselves tight like unto a dish. The things and trials and tribulations we're going through are helping us. And as we seek the Lord's guidance in these things and do the things that he tells us to do, read a conference talk every single day, say your prayers every single day, clean your bedroom, be kind, get rid of contention. Whatever the Lord is guiding us to do, that is how we're going to seal all sides, top and bottom of our own heart, our own selves, so that we are resilient against the attacks of the adversary. It's super exciting. And when we get these things all nice and tight, 
we have developed within ourselves the attributes of Jesus Christ himself, right? Because as we seek to be tight as a dish, we will be able to handle persecution, people saying things that are wrong about us, lies. We'll be able to recognize truth from untruth. The waters that we will be sent upon will probably not be physical waters, but they will be just as stormy and the waves will beat upon us just as difficult. And we may at times feel like we are completely smothered in the depths of the sea of heaviness. What that heaviness is, I don't know, but heaviness of something. And if we are tight like a dish, we will not sink. We not only won't sink, we won't be engulfed with the water of bitterness and the water of discouragement and the water, the loss of hope and the loss of um, faith and our, our eternal perspective. We'll, we'll be able to maintain it because we're tight like a dish. We will be full of trust and know that the Lord is there for us. We'll have faith and hope and charity, kindness that extends what we have today because we're going to start working on it and we're going to do things the Lord tells us and we're going to be filled with gratitude, which is going to change our attitudes, which is going to help us to be able to reach the ends of the earth and bring others with us. If everybody can be tight like a dish, then Satan has no power over us. As we build ourselves tight like a dish, then we have the power to help our children. Remember, put your mask on first at the airport before helping your children. Get tight like a dish. Now, that doesn't mean... You have to get tight like a dish by going off and doing all kinds of things without your children. The children will learn alongside you. But as you tighten your ship, they will tighten theirs. And then your family as a whole will be able to go out and gather Israel, helping others to find faith, trust, patience, love, light, lightness, both in weight and in brightness. Their afflictions and their trials will be lightened by your example, as you follow Christ and develop the attributes that he's asked us to have. And I learned by studying, uh, by listening to conference talks, it was become like him. And they told us to look at preach your gospel chapter six and learn the attributes of Christ and how to develop them in there. It says that Christ was always about his father's business. And to me, I was like, that's how he did it. <laughs> he was always about his father's business. And if we are always about our heavenly father's business, we too will be like Christ because every single person that we face at any time, we will look at differently because we will look at them as if we are placed in their path for their father's business, which is never anger, discouragement, jealousy, nothing except for kindness and love. We will see people differently. We don't even have to know what their problems are to understand that everyone is going through different things and has different weaknesses and that the Lord has a plan for them. And maybe we have a part in that plan. Maybe by us have be, being kind in a situation that maybe normally we would get offended by, we can change how they look at life and maybe their day will be brighter. We can be missionaries and ministering every single day, all day long by treating everybody as if we are out about our heavenly father's business and then we will develop characteristics of christ because we will constantly be striving to be like him as we minister and share the gospel with others through our actions words don't even have to be exchanged to change someone's whole day a simple smile changes days but a sincere calmness and patience and love especially when someone else is attacking or being ornery or having a hard day is irreplaceable. It will stick with them forever. They will go home a new person and they will reflect on the moment that they were able to be in the presence of a mini Christ. Isn't that beautiful that we get that chance to be like that every single day? We don't even want to pass a moment up. And so you may think to yourself, well, when I'm totally overrun with the seas of the water, how will I breathe? How will I continue to be able to get the oxygen I need to be Christ-like, to be loving, to have faith, to have gratitude, to believe, to trust. Where does it going to come from? And the Lord directed them. He told them what to do. They inquired of him. They asked him. They cried to him all the time, asking for advice and then going and doing what he asked them to do. And he directed them to know they could put an air hole on top and on bottom. And as the thing floated in and out and on top and all around, they would open the air hole that was exposed to the air. And when it flipped around from the waves of the sea and they felt upside down and twisted and completely torn, you could open that one and close the other. He taught them how to do it and he will teach us. He will teach us how to keep ourselves breathing and alive and ready to serve him if we will but ask him. But then they thought, we're gonna be dwelling in the dark. We're completely tight like a dish. <laughs> no, nothing's getting in, including light. What do we do? And this time the Lord didn't give him an answer. This time he asked, the Lord asked him to go and figure it out. 
What do you think you can do? And why would the Lord ask him to do that? He just gave it, he, did, he told them how to get the air. Why did they have to figure out how to get their own light? Maybe because our testimonies have to come from choice and from work and from effort. We have to know Christ because we're willing to put forth that effort. Maybe we're supposed to find him. Maybe we're supposed to find him by following him. But he can't necessarily just give us the light because it won't be ours and we won't really, really appreciate it and understand how rare and special this is when you're in the middle of the deep sea and you're engulfed by waves so heavy and beating upon you, so strong, that maybe that light, when you earn it yourself, by going to the highest mountain, going high above the earth, way above all the pressures, saying no to worldliness, standing up, standing out, and waking up, maybe that by doing that, we become pure white and clear, clear from distraction, clear from discouragement, clear from all the things that hold us back, Things that the adversary is constantly throwing at us, but we took the time and we are now molten rocks that are ready to bear the light of Christ during these trials. And that light will shine to those others in the barges too, who maybe their dim light at moments isn't shining as brightly because maybe at some time they let a little bit of discouragement come in while they're in the middle of the sea and their afflictions are beating upon them so hard they don't know where to get that light. But it's okay because the Lord touches us when we come to him. He touches us with his finger personally touching each one of us and enlightening us with a light of Christ that can come from no other way. And we can, we have the opportunity to know that and to feel it in our lives, especially as we listen to the prophets and the apostles and we can hear them speak to us, looking at us. Do you see him talking? He was looking right at you. He was speaking directly to you, telling you exactly what you need to do right now today to develop light during the storms of life. And he promises to do this for us and he will do it. He will lighten us. We have to come to him. We have to put some effort. We have to climb that mountain and we have to mold in those stones and we too will become clear. The Lord stretched forth his hand and touched the stone one by one with his finger. And the veil was taken from off the eyes of the brother Jared and he saw the finger of the Lord. And it was as if the finger of the Lord like unto flesh and blood. And the brother Jared fell down before the Lord for he was struck with fear. He saw his finger, which I think is so cool. When I read these verses, I don't think to myself, I am lacking in faith if I don't see the finger of the Lord in my life. I think the opposite to myself. I think I need to make sure that I recognize him and that might be the same as seeing him because I know he touched me and I know the light that I'm feeling in my life came from Christ. And when I know that, it's the same as seeing his finger touch me. I might as well be like the brother Jared. My faith is strengthened. My testimony enlightened. And you can't take that from somebody. It's yours. You own it. It can't be stripped. It can't be stolen. It's your testimony because you know that God loves you and you know that he will walk beside you and prepare the way from you, for you. And when times slip and you waver a little bit because we're human and it's going to happen, you can remember. Remembering is a huge part of knowing God is in our lives. A huge part. We have to remember him because he knows that the adversary is constantly going to beat upon us. The waves are going to come and they're going to come heavy. And he knows it's going to be heavy. But if we remember, then those stones will continue to lighten, even in the heaviest of storms. So let's talk about those stones. You hear this? This is so cool. So we are now in 4-6. For the Lord said unto them, they shall not go forth unto the Gentiles until the day that they shall repent of their iniquities and become clean before the Lord. And in that day, they shall exercise faith in me, saith the Lord, even as the brother Jared did, that they may become sanctified in me. Then will I manifest unto them the things which the brother Jared saw, even to the unfolding unto them of all my revelations, saith the Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Father of heaven and the earth, and all things that are in them. That's a promise to all of us as we seek to see him. And he tells us, for because, because of the spirit, he hath known that these things are true, for persuadeth men to do good. And 12, and whatsoever things persuadeth men to do good is of me, for good cometh of none, save it be of me. These are all tidbits he's giving us to help us to really be tight as a dish. If you want to know if something comes of me, and if you want to know if you want to partake of that and be part of your life, if you want to know if that's something that's going to help smooth you over so you can make this ocean trip easier, or at least with light, then do those things that are good. Goodness comes from God. All goodness comes from God. And you know what he says in 12? For behold, I am the Father and the light and the life and the truth of the world. And 13, come unto me. I will show unto you the greater things, the knowledge which is hid 
of because of unbelief. 14. Come unto me. And 15. When you shall call upon the Father in my name with a broken heart and a contrite spirit, then shall you know that the Father hath remembered the covenant which he hath made of the fathers of the house of Israel. And there you have it. That's the covenant. That's what we're supposed to study and, and really learn. And how do we apply it to our lives? And who are we? And how do we become God's people? How do we do it? And 18, repent ye all ends of the earth and come unto me and be baptized in my gospel. So this is, this stuff is just so exciting because we have a huge purpose. And we have got to fulfill who we are because the Lord needs us and we need him. So it's perfect. <laughs> and then in verse six, they did give light unto the vessel. And thus the Lord caused stones to shine in the darkness to give light unto men, women, and children that they might not cross the great waters in darkness. And five, and it came to pass that the Lord could, God caused that there should be a ferocious wind blow upon the face of the water towards the promised land. And thus they were tossed about the waves of the sea before the wind. Now I have to say, it says the Lord allowed that to happen. You know why? Number one, he's not going to stop our trials and tribulations because we grow. But he had full confidence. Like we can go full blown to the promised land. These guys are ready. They are tight like a dish. They did everything I asked them to do all the way up to finding my light and bringing it with them. They're tight like a dish. Now, these trials and tribulations, instead of pulling them down and trapping them and causing them not to be able to move and not to be able to function, not to become able to who they are, these, they, he knew. They have an eternal vision of who they were are. They're going to head to the promised land and they're going to be safe because they're tight like a dish. They followed every ex example, every instruction that I gave them and more. They asked questions. They cried unto me. They saw problems and they asked for solutions. And those that I could give them, I gave them. But those that I know they need it because they would need that strength. So they need to f seek it out. They had to go to the highest mountain and they had to molten themselves out of stone so I could touch their hearts and that they could came with me in a broken heart and a contrite spirit so I could take them and know that they're going to have the light in the hardest, darkest moments that mortal existence can give them. I know that because I watched them do it and they, I led them. I went before them. I was with them the whole time. So he says, okay, let's do it. Those trials and tribulations, they push them right to the promised land. Isn't that funny that often we forget that our trials might be taking us where we need to go and that we won't have to feel the pressures and heaviness of them as we come to Christ. Isn't that interesting that we, that Satan sometimes thinks he's going to bog us down, but Christ will use it to move us forward. That's so cool. And that through what, how, what Satan thinks is going to make us go backwards, Christ knows it's going to take us to the promised land. Yeah, it's really cool. It makes me super excited. <laughs> 17, and they were taught to walk humbly before the Lord, and they were also taught from on high. Do we understand why daily communication really comes from? Are we understanding where the personal revelation that we're getting is coming from? We are being led by our heavenly Father and Jesus Christ who dwell in the heavens above and are all knowing, all loving, all compassion, all mercy. That is who is leading us. Let us not forget it. <laughs> And 30, we need to walk humbly before the Lord and remember how great things the Lord has done for us. And we need to teach others. We learn first, and then we teach. There was a young women's um, conference in 1980, and that was the theme. Learn, teach. We have to learn. Study out. Be a scriptorian. Study the scriptures. Learn them. Share them. Make a video. <laughs> Do Marco Polo. Have a young... Um, Young, you know, your friends get together and talk about it. Teach your children. Talk to your husband about it. Talk to your brothers and sisters. Let's learn what we're said. Let's know the Lord and love him. Okay. So they're the promised land. It's amazing. And then, this, you know, in 12 chapters, we have a whole civilization go from rise to fall. So there's a lot more that goes on than we know. And even says that he can't tell us everything. Ether was an amazing prophet that was full of wisdom that he couldn't share because probably because we have to develop ourselves, right? The Lord doesn't give us everything just like, oh, here it is, here it is, here it is. You don't appreciate it the same, right? So some of the, some of the knowledge and some of the understanding and the um, things that Esther had learned, we have to learn for ourselves or, or we have to wait for the Lord to think that we're ready for. But regardless, um, he was amazing. But once they got to the promised land, the same things happened. The secret combinations, conspiracy, Satan knows how to work the same. He's been doing it from the beginning. <laughs> Start out with Cain, right? It even says that in here. It started with Cain. 
And he just keeps on telling people what he wants to do. He wants to take liberty. So anytime you have democracy or, you know, freedoms, he wants to strip that from people because he wants to control. And he wants to control with making the people that he gets to follow him to want greed and, and money. And so then they want to control everybody. But it's really just the work of Satan and secret combinations. And he's been doing this forever. So we know the Lord doesn't work in secret combinations. He doesn't work in the dark. Um, he works in light. He works for everybody. He wants the best. He wants freedom. He doesn't want captivity. So we see the same thing with the Jaredites. And it's it's important to understand that for 25 verse 8 says, For it cometh to pass that whosoever buildeth up seeketh to overthrow the freedom of all lands, nations, and countries. And it bringeth to pass the destruction of all people. For it built up by the devil who is the father of all lies. In 26, time may come that Satan may have no power upon the hearts of the children of men, but they may be swayed to do good continually. They may come into the fountain of all righteousness and be saved. So there we have the contrast. Satan wants to seek to take away all of our freedoms. He wants to control us. He wants not to give us any of our liberties. He doesn't want us to have knowledge from God. He doesn't want any of that. But as we follow him and as we discern truth from right, as we learn and teach others, as we stand firm and courageous, the Lord, there's going to come a time where Satan won't have power over us. And there's going to come a time where Satan won't have power over the whole land, the millennium. But we're talking about personal stuff right here. We can build a testimony strong enough to where the attacks of the adversary don't beat upon us. And I really believe this is true. And, and I also believe that Satan will do everything in his power to move us away from that. But we know that there's one secret key that brings us back every single time is repentance. So we're never far away from where we were. So if you ever see yourself, feel yourself falling back, buying into the lies, slipping into pride, whatever that is, it's okay. Because we're never, we're never far away from where the Lord wants us to be. Repentance is always there and available. So it's super exciting in the sense that we need to move forward at the pace that we're ready for. We need to seek the Lord's guidance and everything. If we get swept back a little bit, repent, get back on, let's move on. Okay, let's move up to, to um, chapter 12, verse 4. Wherefore, whoso believeth in God might with surety of hope for a better world, yea, even a place at the right hand of God, which hope cometh of faith, maketh an anchor to the souls of men, which would make them sure and steadfast, always abounding in good works, and led to the glory of God. I like how you said anchor, especially when we we're talking about what we're talking about. So the Lord's pushing us towards the promised land. We're able to handle a lot of things. But if at any point those storms are starting to bog us down, we can anchor, stay where we're at, and and like we said, refocus, repent, find that broken, contrite spirit, come back to the Lord. And so he is our anchor. That faith is the anchor. It's what stabilizes us. It keeps us from losing ground, keeps and it moves us forward as we are ready to progress forward. So um, he, there are, okay, fountain of righteousness. I once had a, a friend ask me, okay, so you talk about righteousness. What makes somebody righteous? But it's just following the Lord. You know, there's not one denomination that's more righteous than another. It's just following the Lord, seeking him, guiding him, gu taking his guidance, applying it to our lives and moving forward. And so I think it's important that we remember that. But the fountain of righteousness is built upon three principles. It's faith, hope, and charity. And as I've read through this, this is my conclusion. We have to have faith in the Lord. That's what puts our lines us with his, his will and willing to move forward. It gives us the, the, the ability to believe and to know for things that are better. Hope, we have to hope. Faith gives us that hope because it's what gives us our eternal per perspective. It allows us to see that things are much bigger than what mortality tells us they are. It helps us to not treasure up things that can corrupt and, and fall into the dust. It helps us treasure up things that are eternal. Isn't that so cool? And charity is what allows us to spread that goodness. It's because we love everybody equally with ourselves and want all of them to experience the joy and peace that faith brings and the comfort and excitement and assurance that hope offers. And then charity comes naturally from those two, because as you have faith and hope, you love in a way that you can't love without it. And so therefore you want to share with everybody. And that is the gathering of Israel, which the Lord has asked us to do is to seek out every single person and find them. It's the power to save God's children. And it happens one small moment at a time. It happens by seeking after the one, the one lost sheep, the one person who's lonely, the one person who feels in despair and discouraged and sad, the one person who's had a bad day and is just beside themselves. That's how we find it. That's how we do it. But faith, hope, and charity, those are three key things that we have to have. And whenever we're struggling with those three, we just need to go find them. The Lord promises he'll help us. He says, if you so have much have a desire to believe, 
it's enough. I will help you find your faith and your hope, which together will develop your charity. And we can cut, we can read it here, what it says about all this, because I think it's really, really, really good. But in 26, this is 1226, fools mock, but they shall mourn. And my grace is sufficient for the meek, that they shall take no advantage of your weakness. And this is my absolute favorite chapter of the entire Book of Mormon. <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but today it is. 27, either 12, 27. And if men come unto me, will show unto them their weakness. I give unto men weaknesses that they may be humble. And my grace is sufficient for all men that humble themselves before me. For if they humble themselves before me and have faith in me, then will I make weak things become strong. So do you ever feel inadequate? Do you ever feel like I can't do this? Or you look at someone else and think, why not them? They are so much farther ahead than I am. But it's wrong. He tells us right here that we are enough. His grace overrides our weaknesses. Therefore, our weaknesses are really only there to help us grow insignificant in the movement forward in the sense that when we come to him and seek after him and understand the atonement and realize that we have weaknesses? Absolutely. Every single person in the world has weaknesses because weakness is humble as it comes to the Savior and say, I need your help. He wants us to come to him. Be glad you have a weakness. It helps us to come to him humbly, seek after him. And then what happens? Those weaknesses become strong. And in the middle of becoming from weak to strong, we probably wonder like why we have some dips and why it's so hard. It's okay. He says, my grace is sufficient for you if you've come to me. And we're working on your strength and weaknesses together. I just can't get over this. If you've lived a life full of iniquity and sin and you come to Christ, his grace is sufficient to help you the whole way through. You don't have to be bogged down by sin and iniquity. He's going to see you. Come. Come and partake of all that he has. And he will guide you and direct you. And his grace is sufficient. It's so good. 26, behold, I show unto the Gentiles their weakness, and I will show unto them that faith, hope, and charity bringeth unto me the fountain of all righteousness. Yep. And then in 29, it says he was comforted. Why? Because that is very comforting. <laughs> to realize that those three are so powerful and yet so simple. Faith, hopes, and charity. And there's probably a perfect faith and a perfect hope and a perfect charity. I'm guessing Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ probably possess perfected hope, faith, and charity. But that's not what we're asked to do. We're asked to practice whatever faith we possibly can. And with that, some hope will, will flourish and blossom. And we need to hold on to it with our whole heart, mind, and soul. And to, to practice charity a little more each day until we become perfected. And we're only perfected through Christ because his atonement will make up the difference in our weaknesses and they'll become strong. <sighs> it's so awesome. And 31, it says, unto them in great power, it says, okay, so for thus didst thou manifest thyself unto thy disciples for after they had faith and did speak in thy name, that is show themselves unto them in great power. And I love that because this is where we get power from faith, hope, and charity. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, my mind, and soul, and then love your neighbors as you love yourself. There you have it, faith, hope, and charity. In the middle of this, hope, because faith is loving the Lord, and charity is loving others, and hope is what makes it all so awesome. <laughs> and 34, now I know that this love which thou hast had for the children of men is charity. Wherefore, except men shall have charity, they cannot inherit the place which thou hast prepared in the mansions of thy father. In 36, I prayed unto the Lord that he would give unto the Gentiles grace, that they might have charity. And that's what charity gives us. It gives us the desire to seek after Jesus for everybody and to want that for them. Even those that you think are so far away. Is that not? No. And 41, seek Jesus, of whom the prophets and apostles have written, that the grace of God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost, which spirit record of them, may be and abide in you for ever <laughs> and then it talks about the new jerusalem in 13 in in two uh, it says 
that for behold, they rejected all the words of Ether, for he truly told them of all things from the beginning of the man, that after the waters had receded from off the face of the land, it became a choice land above all the land. Right here, we're on it. A choice land of the, of the Lord. Wherefore the Lord would have, have that all men should serve him who dwell upon the face thereof. If we would serve God, we would have full protection. <laughs> it's so simple. Because serving him brings us ultimate peace and happiness. He wants prosperity for us. He wants everything for us, you know? I mean, to walk away is, I don't know, but we don't need to. We don't need to. And then three says, and it, it was the place of the new Jerusalem, which should come down out of heaven and the holy sanctuary of the Lord. When I hear that, I get so excited because this is the land of the new Jerusalem. It's going to, the Savior is going to come dwell here. We have a huge purpose to do. And even if we're in the minority, we have to do it. And love spreads. It's contagious. So we have no choice but to love everybody and to seek the Lord and to understand that he walks before us and that he loves us. And to take that faith that we have and grab onto that hope that we are given and spread charity throughout every moment of our day as we seek the attributes of Jesus Christ. And as we understand that trials and afflictions are just for our good and that when we're following the Lord, he's going to use it to further our progress eternally. He's moving us forward on our own personal promised land to get us where we need to be. And all along the way, we can bring as many people as we want to by gathering Israel like President Russell Nelson has asked us to do. And that light that, it, it, that touches our souls when we find Christ is there to shine during the darkest moments. And we can tap into that light at all times in our lives. And we can give that light to others like a light switch in a room. You turn a light switch on for yourself so you can read a book. Well, it's going to wake up everyone sleeping in the room because light spreads and it, it cancels out darkness. So the Lord has given us the opportunity to be this in a world that's darkening and there's chaos and uncertainty and people are fearful and nervous and we can be filled with faith, hope, and charity. It's amazing. I can't believe God trusts us enough to do this, but we can do it. And I say, let's do it. <laughs> I'll see you guys next week. Bye.